Phillips Mill Art Talk. I'm your host, Laura Womack, and with me is our producer, Jen McHugh. Hello, everyone. Today, we're honored to have Pat Martin join us. Pat needs no introduction, but it's just a pleasure to dwell on her impressive career. Working backwards, Pat was just featured in the Rising Tides exhibition at the Michener Art Museum. That's just one of the latest of, the, of at least 100 shows her work has appeared in. Right now, she's showing at the Honey Clark Gallery in Doylestown. And of course, she's been in the Phillips Mill Art Exhibition many times and was honored artist in 2012. She's exhibited at Ellerslie in Trenton. Pat's career spans six decades. Before moving east, she studied at UCLA and the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. It wasn't until art school that she began drawing, although she always knew she wanted to be an artist. Pat is intuitive, investigative, abstract. We're delighted to welcome Pat Martin to Phillips Mill Art Talk. Well, that was nice. <laughs> glad you like it. Um, we're also glad for everyone who's joined us in the um, audience tonight. And this is a great opportunity to talk with Pat Martin, who is spending a lot of time in our studios these days. Uh, so please take advantage and put your questions in the Q&A and we'll take them as we go along. So Pat, before we look at some of your work, which I know everybody's anxious to do, um, I'd like you to talk about art in your childhood. We all remember that kid in school who was drawing and was destined to be an artist. I remember there was a guy in my middle school that we all crowded around at recess to watch him paint, uh, watch him draw multiple drawings, just churn out Baroque uh, architectural drawings. But you told me that you did not draw as a kid, that you just had crayons. That surprises me. <laughs> Well, we weren't set up. We had uh, we had a two two bedroom house with this is Southern California, uh, with three kids in it, and we were it was a very busy household, and we were outside a lot, and nature was very important to me and all the things that we could do in it. We had a a large property across the street, and. Uh, with an old swimming pool, wonderful old swimming pool with a bar at the top to hold on to, and steps that you could swim under. And, and it was a big estate with orange groves and rose gardens. And, you know, so we were sort of favorite friends and spent a lot of time there. Uh, yeah, we didn't, no one in my house was, was artistic, really. So I, I didn't really see much of that, but I did, I didn't, I was aware, I think, and I think almost, I don't know if almost, but many, many artists have said this, that they kind of discovered a track into their, into their own feelings or their privacy. And I think that's what drawing with crayons or drawing period with whatever I had was something that I noticed. And then if I wanted to be, you know, introverted or by myself or, you know, talk to myself, that was a way to do it. And I never quite forgot it. And I always, in school, always in school when they did art, I, if I had an option of, to do it, do a story or a, you know, essay of some kind, I always would always do artwork with it. I mean, any chance I got, I did. I was very anxious to learn, but uh, it was a slow process. And then I majored in high school in art because I had that seed in me, you know, that that said, "This is what I this is what I really like." <laughs> yeah. Great. So, but in college, of course, you had to draw, and um, you were kind enough to share some of your drawings, your early drawings, with us. And for someone who didn't start drawing until college, uh, these are some pretty impressive drawings. Jen, can we see the uh, contour drawing? Well, 
Do you want me to talk about it? Yes, love to. So this is from Life, and this was the with I had a scholarship um, to Otis Art Institute. Then it was called L.A. County, Los Angeles County Art Institute, and uh, it was in the summer. And uh, we had live models. Most of them were nude, but the nudes, nude drawings I don't have anymore. But we produced a lot over the summer. But Jepson insisted on no, no erasure, pen and ink with a stick pen. So that if you made a mark you didn't like, but you, you were actually, it was contour, the essence of contour is you're not looking at what you're drawing. You're looking at the model and you're very, very focused. The classroom was very extraordinary. You didn't talk to anybody. You just drew. And uh, this was just one of those drawings where they had a model that posed as a gypsy. And, uh, but that, that, that class, that way of working, what didn't just stay with the edge, that wasn't the point. The point I think really was to teach people how to focus. And it, if you if you did a line you didn't like, you just drew over it. You didn't, you couldn't erase it. You started with a wash. Everybody did their wash a little differently. And then when the wash was, you know, just a little bit dry on oatmeal paper, three cents a sheet, hey, this is 50s, <laughs> this is 55, 54, 54 or five. And I was uh, 19 or 20, I was born in 34, so. Well, it's just marvelous for right out of the box. That's that's a marvelous drawing. It was, you know, we did a lot of drawing. Um, so it wasn't like, you know, but it was that first summer I remember very well. We have another of your um, college drawings uh, and I, that illustrates the learning process here, Pat. I mean, obviously you're a savant from the beginning, but tell us about this this painting or this drawing. Uh, well, this this was another model. Again, I got clothes on some of those lines I'd like to take out, but I can't. <laughs> Uh, Jepson, Herb Jepson had his own art institute and he had a, he was good friends with a very famous draftsman from Italy called Rico Lebrun. Anybody that follows early drawings would know the name Rico Lebrun. And uh, so Jepson's techniques really worked. I wasn't the only one that did nice drawings. The class did nice drawings. Um, here, here Jepson's doing a drawing of the shoulder, which I didn't understand for shortening yet. Uh, the, the arm on the right, on my right anyway, is, you know, is straight ahead. The arm was just, you know, on her, on her hip. Uh, but here you could change, see the dark and light. And I always, in, when I'm teaching, I always stress that ability to make line do so many things. Uh, well, it's kind of obvious. And again, the wash started with, with the head there, but it could, could have been anywhere. People did it all differently. This was, I think, brown and maybe black. He didn't like green, so we used brown or black ink and ink wash. So Pat, we actually have two different perspectives on the model here. And uh, one of them is the drawing of the instructor. Is that right? Mm -hmm, on the left, yeah. And That's you're saying that this is, he was showing you how to do foreshortening. He, he, he said, let me show you. So he said, we, we sat on horses. Most people know what a horse is. It's, you straddle, it. it's a good way to draw because you have a balance. And uh, so he sat down and I stood next to him and watched. And he did that drawing. And then he said, I don't know, I think I like yours better. <laughs> he was just being nice. But he was talking about the feeling of it. Uh, 
Yeah. It's a great drawing. I would, wouldn't have known that uh, you were at the, a different angle, but it is nice to be reassured that um, for a new, somebody who's just coming new to uh, drawing, that you still had things to learn, Pat. <laughs> Oh, yes, miles, miles. I had, I actually, I should say that I did have a drawing class at Pasadena City College before I went there. That's how I got the scholarship. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, I'd like to jump ahead to your, some of your most recent work. We're seeing some of it behind you. The two paintings that you're working on, one painting you're working on right now, we'll look at in a minute. That's Upper Black Eddy, which is the uh, golden black. But on the right, uh, oh, sorry, we're going to go uh, to another one that you had at uh, the Michener called, um, let's see, let me look at my notes here, Surge. What's the story behind this painting, Pat? This was in the Rising Tides exhibit for Earth Day at Michener. This is surging. And this is done with the most simple technique. I, I have, over the years, developed a lot of very simple techniques. Some people call them tricks. I call them techniques. But this, this, it took me a while, but I finally discovered that when I, once I got, I wanted to, I got very involved in texture. Once I, I was putting texture on using collage and all different rubbing, sanding, all kinds of ways of creating texture. Um, <clears throat> And then I realized that I could texture from underneath and probably make it easier, get more ideas in terms of form. Because when you're abstract, you, you know, you're, you have to come up with some ideas on the, can, you know, on the surface. So I started tearing paper. And so this whole surface was covered with a just plain old newspaper. And then I painted it all black. And I'm working with oil here. Um, so when that was dry, then I started uh, using chunk, larger pieces of paper and doing a suction technique, which where you put paint thin down on the piece of paper and then pressed it. It's like a printing, but it, it isn't really because you each piece is controlled and you pull it up in a certain way and it makes these wonderful shapes. And it looked a lot like water to me. And I, then, I, then I, in my mind, went back in time. I was a beach girl like we all were in Southern California. And I loved, I loved it when the surf, the surf was wild, you know, it was, it was just crazy pounding down on you and turning you all around and not knowing which, which was up and down. And that's what that painting really is about, was that joy of just being uh, sort of overpowered by just the forces of nature. And uh, that's, that's the way it was. There was a lot of adjustment. Though. I didn't just, you know, you had to kind of rework some areas and well, I just want to uh, identify with you there, Pat, as a fellow uh, Angelino. Uh, I I just wanted to identify with you there, Pat, as a fellow Angelino, I recognize uh, that perspective of the water. So it's a marvelous accomplishment. You did include, you sent us some close-ups of this, which uh, I, I'd love to take a look at now if you want to talk a little bit more about your technique. It's up to you. Well, I don't think, that, you know, it's it's just a matter of trying to get the composition, which is always for me the most difficult thing to do, is to get a composition that holds together on a big, this was 44 by 40. So uh, I worked and worked and on the, not on the top part, but the lower part. Uh, I still look at it, so I'm looking at it right here. <laughs> so it's gray and I discovered that black, like ivory black mixed with white, becomes a really nice blue. So these look black and white, but the painting itself is quite bluish in tone. Marvelous. So do you start with a composition in your mind when you're beginning, Pat? Never, never. Uh -uh. No, it works. It works through. I mean, I, I start with forms, shapes, and then 
it's it's really a discovery process. I, and I ha it relies a lot on on my years of looking. I was always a museum goer, and always a fan of contempt, especially contemporary art history. And uh, UCLA w uh, went there, and we had wonderful art history teachers. And so that my aesthetic judgment kind of comes into play there, and that's just an accumulative thing. You know, if I think something's corny or too obvious or, you know, whatever. Right. Then, and that, you know. That's all from this internalized consumption, education, training that you've done over. Just your own feelings, you know. Right. Uh, it's, I think it's what all artists do, really. Right. Jen, let's take a look at uh, Floating Reef now, please. Um, and this is the one we see on the right in behind you, Pat. Uh, it's in blue with the ropes. And the ropes really pop out of the viewer. Um, it has so much depth. Um, you know, I think we, we all think of the traditional artists with their paintbrushes working to get that depth. But when you're working so intuitively, um, how do you approach that? I frankly don't use brushes very much anymore. I do. I do use them some, but not a great deal. Um, this, a friend of mine, I'm blocking on his name because it's an unusual name. Uh, I, I was going to be in a show that was, it was all about the environment and water. And uh, I was just couldn't decide what to do. So I went to his house and they showed me some photographs so this, and then I, I selected a few, and I don't usually work from photographs, but this one was stunning. I loved it. It had a figure in it too. It, I've changed it a lot, but th that's where the idea came from. Uh, so I started out working in pastel, and it just pastel and water n not quite didn't quite make it for me in terms of the movement, but. Anyway, so the, the what is underneath is pastel, and I I changed it from the photograph. But uh, then I had an idea. Since today, all so many things are allowed, or you know, permissive, or what permitted. Um, I had some. I had a basket full of ropes and cords and yarn. Not yarn, but all kinds of things. So I um, scanned them and then I cut them out. So it literally is a collage on top. Then I worked the pastel, I you know integrated them. And, um, but it had a dramatic effect and, and I liked it. So I always identified it as a collage because people thought I was really a magical realist uh, in some of those cords, but nope, it's not. It's glued down. It's a really striking painting, Pat. I'm curious for the Michener exhibit, did you set out with, uh, was this intended for the Michener from the beginning or? No, it, was, uh, it was the Princeton Art Alliance show. Yeah. It was and Princeton University was where it was. And did you, uh, you have this and, and um, surging, was that also, did you intend that for the Michener or another show? It was just for my own, that was just me. That was just a, a recollection. It was actually a pleasure to work on. They really um, work well for that, uh, for that, for the topic of that exhibition. Oh, with Laura, with Laura Womack, or Loa, I go. I go, right, that's right. <laughs> I was working with two Lauras. The, there you go, exactly. You said your work is investigative, uh, Pat. What do you mean by that? It's an intriguing... Well, I try everything. <laughs> I try everything I can think of to get a certain feeling uh, or to make it interesting to me because, it's, you know, it's... It's, you know, if it has to pass my own test, 
in terms of being interesting to do and uh, you know, it's it's a struggle. Sometimes it's a real struggle. You get very depressed. You feel as though you, you know, you've spent all this time and what do I have? Ah! And uh, yeah, it's investigative in terms of you inv investigate materials. I say that I partner with materials because my ter materials are very important to me. I have a whole, and also from teaching, I have a whole lot of varied I don't just work in one one or two mediums. I work, I have a lot of collage collected. I have a lot, just a lot of different things, different tools that I draw with or paint with or glue down. So that in that way, it's investigative. This, let's see if this works. Right. We, we did talk about doing a studio tour uh, today, but we have, uh, we've got a lot going on, Pat. I know you've got a lot going on, so we're not gonna do the, the studio tour today, but um, Jen, I think Jim has a question that goes to, um, to Pat's methods. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jim wanted to know about your palette colors, Pat. Mm. What would he like to know about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, I happen to know, is an artist himself, and he's very interested in color. Uh, but I think you don't work with a um, you don't work with a palette per se, since now you're doing a lot of pouring, is my well, understanding. I tend, I tend not to work with too many colors at once. I mean, I integrate colors into a, the basic color, like say with blue or something. Uh, but uh, I, I tend to work with just maybe two or three colors on in abstract work. It, it seems to me that, that, that for me, the texture and the composition and the line are more, not that I don't love color, I do, but I tend to be able to organize better if I get, don't get too lost in too many colors. I like simplicity. Uh, and that just seems to be uh, not intentional, really, but just the way it's been for me. Do you have favorite colors that you like to work with, Pat? I use a lot. Of, I love brown. For years, I did a lot of brown. Uh, I love brown and black. I love blue. And uh, I love uh, yellow, yellow gold. And yeah, I don't have, it's not. Uh, I don't, I, I, I put out a full palette though. I really do. I put out Raoul Reds, I love uh, Alizarin Crimson, uh, but I, they are not obvious. It's just a richness uh, most of the time. And Jen, we have a, a question from Thierry. Uh, yes, he wanted to know, Pat, if you said that the ropes were scanned. Yes. Uh, yes, they were. I just put them down on my printer. I just scanned them on the printer. And um, they came out and I went, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> and uh, then I cut them out and, uh, you know, arranged them and all. Pat, let's look at um, one of your early uh, paintings. We're going to bounce back around through your um, your career here. Waves breaking, Jen, if you've got that available. Um, this is also a work about water, but it's very different. Well, it's a it was a pivotal piece for me. I did it on my drafting table in in Lambertville. Uh, I was I was every three years I would try and go home, and I drove all kinds of ways and car run, car, one of those cars that you could drive away, cars and so on. But in, in, in anticipation of going home, I, this is a small, not what is it, 11 by 14 or something like that. I don't know, it's sort of small medium. Um, and this is acrylic paint. And uh, I hadn't really, learn to control texture. This was early on when I was just interested in it, but not hadn't done much of it. So this is sponges, just 
you know, uh, but I, I couldn't help it. That's just what came forward was what I was looking forward to seeing. It's nothing like the Pacific Ocean, I can tell you. And um, so that was just a felt, very intuitive piece. And uh, well, I think that nature is um, such a great uh, subject for abstract art, really. And I'm not sure why that is, but I personally, just to share with you, I find that um, abstract art that's based on nature is very evocative and uh, very gets a response. Do you have any thoughts about that, Pat? Why nature would be such a good subject for abstract art? Well, it's, um, I, I really, well, I discovered, you know, not discovered texture, but started using texture just from looking up close, your point of view, if, you, if you're not doing a panoramic kind of view, which is what the gold paintings are panoramic, but uh, then you're looking at just this incredible, miraculous life that's all around us. And I've always found that inspiring and it's all over my house, it's everywhere. I, I try to look closely just because I'm truly enthralled by it. And so a lot of that goes into my work, especially living up here in Upper Black Eddy now. That's very, I, it I would be hard to move away from here. Uh, not sp as specifically just here, but I have it out of every window. I live in a, in a, um, um, a mobile home, but I have windows all around me and I have the woods and you just have to walk out and you see branches and birds and all that. <laughs> Good. We have a, um, a request from Phoebe to look at the black and gold painting on the left for us over your right shoulder. This is, I apologize. This is just, uh, uh, I was interrupted. <laughs> And I couldn't finish, haven't finished this one yet. Uh, this is a smaller version of a larger piece that I did and sold. Uh, this was again, that textural idea of coming working from underneath. And um, I can't really see this, but um, again, I painted it black after there was a, uh, actually there was an under, other painting underneath here too. Now, I think that actually this one was another painting, but anyway, there was texture underneath. And I had fallen in love with these gold, large gold uh, uh, oil sticks. And um, so I just started rubbing, taking the side of them and going across the black texture and up comes this, what kind of looks like a field to me and I live in Upper Black Eddy, so I immediately thought rocks. And that's a simple little thing like that. It just set me off. And I, I, did I do love what happens when you rub in. Some of it's rubbed, some of it's swiped, some of it's paint thinner, it's, it's paint thinner, you know, along with, but I suggest for people to try that. It's really, really fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jen, Jen has done yet. Sorry, go ahead, Pat. Please go ahead. Well, the sky I'm toying with. This this is, that's, I don't know what I want to do over there. But but I, the reason I wanted to talk about it was just to try this. I, I, I'm sort of captured by that texture for the time being. It was, it was actually a, a fun painting. It's a very striking one. We have um, the we have an image of the earlier painting that you did in the okay. same style, Upper Black Eddy, uh, which is also ma magnificent. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a bigger painting. It's forty-eight by forty-eight, I think. That's on uh, linen, which I had never worked on linen before. A friend uh, Ilya Barger gave that to me, and uh, she was. It was just a nice canvas. <laughs> I got to do it. It was great. Very nice. All right, Jen, I, let's go back to the question, the Q&A. 
Uh, what do we have there? Uh, we have, oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Phoebe, so Alice was the one that wanted to see the picture over your right hand shoulder. Um, which we just discussed. And Phoebe wanted to know, how different is the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic Ocean? Well, I guess it's a sort of a personal point of view. I, I grew up on the Pacific and I, there was no, of course it's different now. It's hugely different now, as I found out one of the last visits I made. When I, do you remember, if you've ever watched Ken Burns' special, we're on, on, the, uh, on the big uh, Midwestern, when a lot of people from Oklahoma and other Midwest people moved to California. Uh, well, there was a beach there. It was called uh, Tin Can Beach. It was when we, my father would take us on rides. And we'd drive past it and we'd say, what is all that on that beach? You know, and there was tin cans of people camping. And uh, they were called Okies then. Yeah. This is, this is in the, now we're talking about late 30s, early 40s. So I'm old, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got lost there. What was I talking about? The Pacific versus the Atlantic Oceans. But yeah, the Atlantic. So what I'm saying in general is at that time when I was growing up, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. Uh, you could hot foot it down to the beach and it was all free and open. And since I've lived on the East Coast, there are so many rules connected to the beach that I don't, I kind of don't, I'm not drawn to it as much. But when I was growing up, and I'm not saying it isn't that way, it isn't that way now. But the Pacific was always where people started surfing. I unfortunately was, it gotten, surfing when I was growing up was big heavy boards that could fall on you if you made a bad move. It was before polyester, polyethylene or whatever they put in them, it made them light. But heavy boards were used in Hawaii and then they were brought to Southern California. And, uh, but I was a little too old and in college to start being a surfer. So. <laughs> Otherwise I would have been. <laughs> Pat, I got a question early before, the, um, before we started this uh, conversation from uh, Kathy. And she wanted to know, I think this is a question you could ask of any artist, but she wanted to know how you know when you're done. And I think, um, you know, we, we always ask this of abstract artists because you don't have, you know, a certain number of eyes and ears or whatever to well, show. What I say to that, I know I've been asked it many times, is when I don't want to change anything. Uh, however, that sometimes it goes over a long period of time and I've been known to take work back and change it a bit. Yeah. So it's sort of watch out, huh? But, uh, yeah, if I don't, if I'm, if I'm satisfied with it, pleased with it, then I don't, that's done. Do you um, ever give up on a painting? Say, I'm not satisfied and I can't do anything with it. Definitely. Well, then I go back to it later, usually. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, of course, everybody's got paintings. Yeah, I've got paintings li lining my walls that I'm going to get back to or, you know. No, there's got to be a lot of failures. That's just the way it is in the arts. Right. All right, Jen, back to the questions. Who's up next? Uh, we have a question from Robert Beck. Uh, he wanted to know what things have you learned, Pat, over your career that help you organize your approach or discover new things? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What learned? What have I learned over my career that helped me? Um, well, I don't think I've changed a great deal on that. Um, I've always started. I, I, I've learned one of the things I've learned is a lot more about materials and how to use them in different ways. You know, a lot of it is just my own personal discovery because when I was in school, 
in the 50s, there was some great things going on on the East Coast, but in the West Coast, nah, not so much. I mean, abstract expressionism hadn't really had impact yet. Um, but yeah, how to use my chair. One thing, one thing I've learned psychologically is not, not to give up, persevere. Some of, the, some of the, I think some of my best work is work that was worked on for a long period of time. And so that I try to be patient and, uh, you know, you've done it before, you can do it again kind of thing, <laughs> you know, you can finish this. Uh, so a lot of it that is psychological, I would say that that's, that's changed, that I have more confidence than I did. When you don't have a history yet, you know, it's hard, especially as a woman. <laughs> I was married to an artist, right? So I was uh, for a while, for eight years. But uh, yeah, I would say a lot of it's psychological and just explorative, you know, knowing that I could figure something out here. So it's a confidence, really. Well, I think it is, yeah, but it's gained by having defeats and having disappointments and still go, still continuing. So I always say that to students, you know, it's, it's just another layer, don't worry about it, just work over it or, you know, do something else, but don't think you're a failure. You touched on something there, Pat, that um, reminds me, Jen, in our conversation, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Jen, I apologize. Uh, in our conversations uh, preparing for this, Jen pointed out that, um, you know, you were training and becoming an artist very early on in um, abstract painting. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, Jen, and ask Pat yourself, I don't mean to speak for you. Oh, gosh, I think <laughs> now she put me on the spot, Pat. Well, I didn't uh, want to take credit for your, your question, so. <laughs> I think when we were talking earlier in the, or last year, um, you were talking about trying to choose classes and there weren't necessarily classes that you could take to learn about painting abstract. Work. Well, then, then you would, uh, that would be a design class, you know, in art school. Now we're talking in the, in the 50s, not the 60s, 50s. That would pretty much would be a design class, like where you would design uh, and you would learn about uh, geometric, you know, opposed to organic shapes and how to place them and how to move or, you know, your eyes around the picture and all, all those really important things. Uh, that it's just sort of changed its name. But I I became abstract because I I I didn't want I never wanted to copy nature. I, I'm not I wouldn't be a good plain air painter because I don't want st to. I study nature and look at it all the time, but. I didn't really want, I wanted to invent my own shapes and my own color scheme and my, I wanted to be the inventor here, you know? And I basically wanted to express myself. I, I liked Van Gogh, I liked the idea of abstract, when I learned about abstract expressionism from a um, Life magazine. They came out with two, two uh, separate issues on abstract expressionism in New York. And I just thought, wow, that's, that's where I want, want to go, you know? Because I, I didn't want to worry about whether the glass looked just right or the trees, the leaves were the right color green and all that. I mean, for me, I wanted to go right to expressing myself. And that is pretty much what I've done, although I've become more refined as I've gotten older. Uh, there, I want to get back to your uh, paintings, um, but it's such a pleasure to talk to you. What you're talking about makes me think of uh, uh, Chinese artists who uh, were in your style and your um, the way you talk about your art reminds me of how they talk about uh, the importance of qi, the life of the line, and uh -huh. uh, the inspiration that comes to them. They don't 
traditionally believe in very representational depictions of nature. Mm -hmm. Do you have any exposure to Chinese art? Well, yeah, I've seen a lot of Chinese art, and it, I mean, it's too general to, but as far as line or putting in, having inspiration, and, you know, a line is just straight from your, your whole body. I mean, I really believe in using your whole physical structure to express yourself. Why not? You know? And uh, certainly with, uh, I do a press release thing that's very important in my drawing, I think, with charcoal. And, uh, you know, if you press down hard, you get a deep block and it's wide. If you let up, you know, it's Paul Clay said, you know, that line is a, a dot extended. And that's true. And uh, so it's, it all comes from your feeling. And uh, if you can learn to somehow compose it or make it, so the space is very important, make the space interesting. So it's not just drawing, it's what you haven't touched to. Right. Well, let's go back to paintings. That's, we really wanna see those. Uh, what have you got up next for us, Jen? We have wintry bush. <laughs> yeah, there's some texture under there. Uh, that really is a drawing uh, with some paint and ink, ink in it. And, that, and I didn't realize until I had done it that it was actually a bush right outside my window that I look at every day. But I found that if, I, if you have something and you put it on the wall, it'll affect your work. You know, I mean, especially objects or, well, things outside too. Uh, yeah, this was, um, I think this was ink. This was more of a water-based piece. And it just snow falling on a bush. And I always liked it a lot. I don't have too much to say for it, but except for what I've already said about having texture underneath, which kind of inspires me uh, to be able to rub with a the um, charcoal, you know, against it and get those shapes. If a shape has a look of natural form, I'm, I favor that more than, you know, a careful design. I like the look of nature. I think it's fascinating that you painted it and later recognized what the subject was. Yeah, I wasn't that long afterwards, I, yeah. I had it framed up and then I looked in the backyard. Well, I looked in the backyard all the time, but it was just the weather, the snow, you know, that it's still there, my bush. I wouldn't let Dylan do anything to that bush. <laughs> okay, Jen, let's go back to our questions. We've got a bunch of them backed up. I think, who's up next? Yes, we have, uh... Jim Feld wanted to know how long before your first conception of a painting and how much does it change before the final? Well, I don't really have a conception of the painting. I jump in with materials and almost always you would never see those materials again because they get layers, there's layers of, of the, I don't, I don't start with an idea. I don't, I work, I might, I might start with, let's say I want to do some shape, some linear shapes that look like branches. I could do that, but that would be very general in terms of what came out. Yeah. Pat uh, referenced uh, collage earlier, Jen. I know you have some images of her collages. Should we take a look at some of those? Sure. <coughs> While we're waiting on that, Louise has asked um, whether you learned anything through teaching Pat. Um, your classes, she says, were always loaded with information. Lots, lot, I, did I learn from them? Oh, sure, of course. It's a give and take. Uh, sometimes I laugh, I start, I look at a painting and I start to laugh and I go, oh, I shouldn't do that. 
but anyway it's no it's you know it's full of life and full of experiments and i get a lot of ideas from students and i hope to I give them some you know and i i when i remember in art school once there was an incredibly talented girl and i copied her work because i wanted to know what she knew she was working with a Conti crayon sort of a, with the figure she was just magnificent even the instructors were eye popping so i copied her i mean i copied that approach and i got all kinds of guff from students other students saying you know think for yourself pat so i always say students copy anybody copy you're here to learn we all want to you know so don't you can copy me, sure, you can do it, but it won't last because if you're working, you're, you yourself will come through and it does. That's, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> Very good. Well, we've, we have a lot of questions and I, um, I, since it's a good opportunity for people to talk to you, Pat, I'm gonna go back to the questions. Um, Jen, we had something about the waves breaking, is that right? Yes, we have two questions about waves breaking. One is, how did you use sponges in this piece? And the other one was, uh, Janet was struck with the quality of ambient light you created. Uh, in that same painting? Yes, yes. Let's see that, uh, that if, Jen, if we could, let's have that come back up. Yeah, there we go. Uh... Well, I use different kinds of sponges and then you can just press paper to paper and you get that same set of suction technique. Um, again, you see here's limited color. This is really, isn't exactly pink, but I don't know why I got into that, but I did And brown is brown. Um, the light. Uh, well, it's just the way light hits things that, that I felt. Sometimes you do that to separate shapes. Uh, but the sponges, I, I use um, very tight, some to transfer paint from one shape to another when making it very subtle. I use something that I get at the dollar store, a bag of sponges for a dollar. Yeah, and I cut them up. But then the sponges that have are more larger holes that were useful. But uh, when you want to really sen be sensitive and transfer one, grad, you go from one shape to the other, those fine, fine sponges or plastic sponges, they really work well. Uh, ambient light. Uh, I'm not so sure I know what you mean. I just, I don't know exactly what you're asking me. Working with um, available light, I guess. I'm just taking a stab at that. Well, there. This is just out of my head. This is, this is just life experience. That's all. It's all coming from you. Okay, Jen, we have a question from David. What would David like to know? Um, David wanted to know uh, what art forms do you like, Pat? And how does your art inform the way you see or hear? Um, well, what art forms do I like? Well, I like, I love simplicity. I love com complexity within a simplicity, you know, so that I don't like to labor when I look at a piece of art, anybody's art. I don't like to struggle trying to figure where they want me to go or where they want me to be or there's too much in it for me i get too it's too overwhelming for me so i like things that are simpler although within that to have i like to be able to look at it at a distance and be able to approach it and walk forward and be interesting on any any level um i also what was i going to say there uh, I can't that's all right. That's all right. I think that was a great answer. 
happening to me since it <laughs> might happen. I'd lose the thread of what I was trying to say. We're taking you all over the place, Pat. I'm curious to know, I'm going to combine two questions because we're, uh, we've got a lot more questions from people and I'm not sure how much we're going to get to look at your artwork, but it's such an opportunity to talk to you. When you were in art school, were there many other women there? Uh, what was that like being a woman in art school in the 50s? There was a lot of GIs, you know, on the GI Bill. Uh, they were very serious and we weren't all that serious. And we were underneath, but we were frolicsome too. Uh, there, was, there was quite a few girls. They, the thing is with girls is they get married and have children and they lose faith and then they come back and then they come back in their 40s or 50s you know when they can it's not you know that's that's the way it goes and the guys could just kind of barrel through and go on to uh, if they were persistent it's it's just as hard for men i guess but for women it was always very hard and i i always discouraged girls from you know having their giving their husbands opinions on their work because the you know that that just didn't you know come back to class and i'm saying that's great and they say we don't like the way you're working <laughs> and uh but yeah I, I don't think girls were well okay here's one incident that really really shattered me at the time i was at pastina city college and i was about uh 16 or 17 something like that and uh no, I wasn't even that old. But anyway, we were all having a cigarette break. We, we all smoked then with the teacher. And he made this statement to some, I didn't ask it of him, but he said, there's never been an important woman artist. Now this was, this was a, a good tea. I mean, you know, he was a good artist and a teacher. And he said, there's never been an important woman artist. I don't know why that is, he said, but it's true. And I was, you know, I was unsophisticated, you know, in terms of going, going to a lot of important museums and history of art and so on. Uh, and I, for the longest time, I just thought there's something in my genes. There's something that we just can't, well, is this can't be this this can this be true? I questioned it, but I was all so hurt by it, you know, that I thought it might be true because in the in those days women were thought to be second class citizens. They didn't know much about anything except domestic issues, and uh, so that that set me back a little while. But of course, I didn't stay with it. You know. <laughs> I think we've heard stories like that before. Yeah, that is that is a terrible thing. It doesn't wouldn't happen today. Well, but then it was sort of like that's the way it was. You can't do anything about it, honey. It does yeah. sometimes still happen today. But I th I think I've got an answer for him as why that is why that might have been true. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, Edie, your friend wants you to know that she's attending from Houston, so she gives a shout out. Yeah, Thank and you. then. Um, Edie Sharp and uh, Jen, we we can maybe get squeeze in a couple more questions here. I'm going to turn my light on so that I'm not sitting in the dark while you get us a question for Pat. Okay, uh, Deborah Eater says you work with so many different materials and in many layers. Are there particular materials you like to begin with? or ones that you like to turn to for the final layers? Well, I love oil paint and I especially love pouring oil paint, but not as a complete thing in itself, but it, it gives you, uh, when you're discouraged about something or it's just not working, pouring over it allows you to see another direction, another path. And believe me, you need that sometimes. Uh, so I love oil. I love drawing materials, Conti, pastel, uh, charcoal, of course, inks, 
I don't use much ink right now, but I have in the past. Um, collage, I use carbon paper. Be carbon paper is a beautiful way to use, uh, to get a velvety effect of black, especially the old, or black or blue. I like the blue better. Um, so there's just all kinds of things that you just experiment with. So my place is usually kind of a mess if I'm working and it's just with all kinds of things. I have a choice of, you know, no, nothing's exotic. It's just, it's what you do with it. Uh, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, Robert Hansen has a question that has uh, occurred to me so many times to ask you. I can't believe I haven't asked you. Um, he's got the very insightful question of how do you resolve the challenge of the composition? And this is something I've heard you refer I to. I struggle with that because I like simple compositions and I, I love Oriental art and that, that effect. I always wanted to go to Japan never have been able to but a lot of uh, I found a lot of commercial artists that come and take fine art because that was what they did to earn a living and and so on and they they know how to design I and mean, they know how to Raji Cook who just died uh, was wonderful that way he you know when you know how to um, make Make one thing is important. It doesn't have to be that way. There's many ways to compose, but I am very envious of, I, I noticed in my teaching, and I'm not sure this is true, that boys seem to understand composition just in, innately. I mean, I used to teach fifth grade and I, I taught younger kids, mostly high school, uh, but uh, they, I, I think that might be from making models or I don't know why. I mean, it may not even be true. It just was my impression that that just seemed to come naturally to them. But it didn't come naturally to me. And uh, so I always struggled with it. Sometimes I lose large portions of a piece because I didn't think the composition is off. And it doesn't have to be outstanding but it has to be enough so that it doesn't bother you if a piece bothers me i'm going to change it because i don't want to look at it so i don't think anybody else would either <laughs> fair enough so pat um we're coming up on the top of the hour but i can't um i can't say goodbye without asking you you mentioned that you're looking at working bigger as you move forward from here uh Aren't there challenges? Oh, there had, oh go ahead. <laughs> well, I, well, I just it, since you do a lot of pouring and you work with your whole body, uh, I think working big is is just a challenge physically. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I do. I've never had a space. Well, I wouldn't say that I've never had a space, but most of the time I've never had a space that was large. When I taught at Solbury School, I used my living room there as a, I was head of boarding girls at Solbury School and taught art, but I used my drafting table in different places here. I, I'm using my living room. Kind of puts a little bit of a jolt in your social life, but you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, I do want to work bigger. We, I think partly because I've never really had a chance to. In other words, if I paint large here, then I've got most of my spaces used up. <laughs> so if I have a big space, I can, you know, I think do more work and work. To, I just want to explore it. I may not stay with it. I think I'll always love working small and drawing. So I have that here. Uh, the, the studio that my son built, or con, um, contracted and built is going to be uh, the shop. I'll be able to use a studio. So that will be something new for me. That's very exciting, Pat. We wish you all the best going forward with that. And we hope you come back. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for coming, everyone.
Thank you all for joining us as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. I still have a, a whole bunch more, so maybe we'll have another, another opportunity for that. Um, thank you also to Jen McHugh, our producer. Yay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and to Dennis Riley, who helps us behind the scenes, putting these shows together. You both make the show possible, so we appreciate that. Um, and we appreciate all of you spending some time with us on Sunday afternoon. Next up on Art Talk, we'll highlight the Phillips Mill Youth Art Show, which is now live online. You can find it through phillipsmill.org website. Um, we're very proud of the show because it features some extraordinarily talented artists from high schools in the area who um, don't necessarily, they don't have galleries to show their work and they're very talented artists. So we'll have Kathy Schreyer, uh, who founded the art show um, and is a very active member of the mill. We'll have an art uh, teacher from one of the schools who helped putting together, put together the show. And we'll have Skylar Cauley, who's juried into the 91st Phillips Mill Art Show after participating in the youth show. So we help, hope you'll join us for that. Thank you again. This is Phillips Mill Art Talk and I'm Laura Womack.